Hello everyone, this is Artur Zmelov from the University of Toronto and I have a series of lectures about quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. Now the plan here is to provide uh, eight short lectures that covers important subjects for understanding the topic and we will start with electronic structure problem which is the key problem for quantum chemistry. We'll do it in the first quantization, and then we'll move on to second quantization, which will provide us uh, with the necessary bridge to uh, qubit formalism that is uh, very useful for quantum computing. In lecture four, I uh, will review variational approach in the qubit space, and that will lay solid grounds for the most popular these days method variational quantum eigensolver which poses actually two important problems is how to find unitary transformations and then how to do measurements so those are the two subsequent lectures and we'll end with uh, discussing symmetry projections and how this can be useful for uh, improving the search process in variational quantum eigensolver now, in these lectures, I will assume some knowledge of quantum mechanics that doesn't go too far beyond the regular textbooks. Also, I will assume that uh, you are somewhat familiar with quantum computing and will not review things like gates and circuits. If you need a reference book, you can uh, look at uh, Nelson and Chunk or any other book covering that subject, but uh, we won't go too much into uh, the details there. Now, these lectures will generally just present the uh, topics uh, like in an overview fashion. And uh, if you want to understand them deeper, then I'll uh, provide some literature in the beginning of each lecture where you can uh, look into uh, the concepts. And uh, for the electronic structure, these are the two classical books uh, which you can refer to if you uh, feel that uh, you would like to learn more about the electronic structure theory and especially on a classical computer. Now the main subject of the electronic structure are molecules, a variety of them, and uh, we can do exciting things with them, create materials, uh, pharmaceuticals or uh, devices, but from the theoretical perspective, that's uh, for us, the molecules are essentially a collection of electrons and nuclei. And uh, our task is to describe their properties from uh, first principles, which means we don't want any experimental data as an input, but rather we'd like to just uh, base our calculations on the number of electrons and uh, uh, type of nuclei that are present. Right. So that's uh, what uh, usually is referred to as the first principles in this uh, domain. Now, when it comes to quantum mechanics uh, of molecules, one of the main uh, equations that uh, like everyone starts with is time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is applicable only when the molecule is isolated and uh, non-relativistic which means it doesn't have any heavy atoms. So mostly first few rows of the periodic table. Now we have a uh, Hamiltonian here, a molecule, and uh, small r's will be variables for the electrons, big r's, uh, uh, nuclear variables, t is for time. So we have a time independent uh, part, which Hamiltonian usually is, and time dependent part and the wave function contains both uh, coordinates which are time independent and uh, time coordinate. Now, as I said, mostly molecules, unless you consider them in the strong electromagnetic fields which are changing with time, molecules in vacuum uh, have the Hamiltonians which are time independent and uh, for solving the time dependent equation, then we can uh, write the solution as a linear combination of so-called stationary states 
uh, guys that don't have time, multiplied by the phase factors, which in, uh, involve uh, energies. And both uh, stationary functions and, and their energies can be obtained from the time independent Schrodinger equation. So this is exactly like you would do it for any other system. And uh, for molecules, you can do it as well. So the only thing then uh, will be left is to find these coefficients that are coming from usually uh, initial conditions. And so technically, we can solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation uh, using the solutions of time independent Schrodinger equation. And that's uh, one way at least. And that's why we can now focus on time independent Schrodinger equation. Now, this is a difficult equation still to solve, even though we got rid of time. And the difficulty comes from uh, essentially dimensionality of uh, objects that are involved. It's a differential equation which is not exactly solvable because there are differential operators in the Hamiltonian. And uh, uh, even before we think about solving it, uh, what uh, poses a problem is even storing the solution. And uh, again, this is just a result of dimensionality to appreciate that. Let's just consider a simple example of hydrogen molecule. In case of hydrogen molecule, we have two electrons and two nuclei, so four variables, uh, but all of them, they live in the three-dimensional space, and we ignore spin for now, which is another complication. But even without spin, it's just uh, three-dimensional uh, coordinates, uh, x, y, and z for, the, for each of these r's, right? So in total, the wave function is 12 dimensional. And since the equation is not exactly solvable, uh, you can obtain the solution numerically. But to store the wave function, uh, you would need to put it on the grid. And in each dimension, let's say you put 10 points, then for 12 dimensional object, it would require you to use a trillion of points. So to see how the Dimensionality essentially goes to exponent. You can simply consider it even a simpler example, two-dimensional object, where if you put 10 points per dimension, you get easily 100 points uh, for the wave function. Now, of course, the hydrogen molecule is not the most interesting object. And if you want to go to, say, proteins, study those properties, uh, those objects, uh, then the dimensionality grows uh, many, many, many times. And uh, the, the number of points that you need to store these wave functions uh, become astronomical, essentially. Uh, so big that uh, someone made a calculation that even if you take all atoms in the universe to build a computer to store this uh, object, uh, you will run out of matter in the universe, essentially. And this is a big problem of quantum mechanics for large systems, is because with every particle, uh, you get the more dimensions in your wave function, and uh, that causes exponential growth of complexity. That's the main problem, and uh, someone needs to, of course, address that. Okay, to address this problem, back in 20th century, Born and Oppenheimer suggested that uh, we should actually treat uh, electrons and nuclei separately. But not to separate, of course, uh, electrons from nuclei, otherwise molecule will uh, disassemble. But uh, to consider in the differential equation, electronic variables first, with maybe freezing the nuclear variables as parameters, and then return for the nuclei and uh, treat them. So the classical intuition behind that step is that the electrons are much lighter objects, and uh, therefore uh, the nuclei kind of physically make sense uh, to consider as a slower subsystem. Now, of course, in quantum mechanics, uh, classical intuition sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But in this particular case, it actually was quite fruitful. Now, what they did, they separated the hem total Hamiltonian into uh, two parts, where essentially in the red, uh, we have a part where you can freeze the electronic variables as uh, parameters. And it contains the kinetic energy of electrons, uh, and then all Coulomb interaction between electrons and nuclei, between electrons and between the nuclei. And then the only part that doesn't go into the electronic Hamiltonian is the nuclear kinetic energy. There it's a differential equation, a differential uh, operator respect to the big R, so you cannot really make them 
parameters there. Now, using the electronic Hamiltonian, where nuclei are frozen, we can uh, pose a different problem with the uh, function, electronic function, uh, and uh, look for the essentially solutions where electronic function becomes the eigenstate for the electronic Hamiltonian. And that is essentially the electronic structure problem. Now, the nuclei are frozen in some configuration. And depending on that configuration, the eigenvalues of this problem here in red uh, will uh, be different depending on the configuration, essentially. And uh, the nice thing about this, uh, sometimes we call Born-Oppenheimer approximation, is that uh, once you solve the electronic structure problem, you can go back and solve the total problem. That's what uh, can be done in the spectroscopy, for example. This electronic energy uh, or potential energy surfaces, because these are electronic energies that depend on the nuclear coordinate, right? they form some potential surfaces on which the nuclei are moving and uh, vibrating, rotating. Right? And uh, later one can find all the uh, essentially vibrational levels and rotational levels based on those uh, electronic calculation. As you can see from this picture, all these vibrational and rotational levels are separated somewhat uh, not so far from each other compared to the electronic levels which are farther away from each other. And that's, that's what uh, uh, is a proper justification for the separation of the electrons from nuclei in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And Born-Oppenheimer approximation breaks down if your potential energy surfaces uh, come close to each other, then you cannot use a single surface to obtain the properties of the, of the molecule. You need to account for multiple uh, solutions of electronic uh, problem. But uh, in the situations where electronic energies are far away from each other, normal situations, then you don't even sometimes need to go to the uh, full problem. You can answer some interesting questions, for example, about uh, chemical reactions using just uh, potential energy surface as a, as a kind of guiding quantity. So here on this picture, we have uh, potential energy uh, with respect to some uh, reaction coordinate. And what this means is that we start with some uh, configuration of uh, two molecules. And if you want to understand where the uh, reaction will go and how much energy system needs to uh, obtain from outside in order to go from one conf configuration to another, you can just analyze uh, what is the potential energy barrier uh, that separates those two forms. And uh, that will be enough to say uh, how energetically favorable reaction is or not. And also, uh, you probably heard about the uh, catalyst uh, chemical compounds that uh, really change the potential energy surface and make barriers, uh, for example, lower. So that stimulates the reaction. All that you can study by just solving the electronic structure problem rather than going to the full dynamics or solving the full uh, electronuclear problem, which is harder because it has more variables. Now to summarize, essentially quantum chemistry uh, by many, what quantum chemistry means is uh, that it's electronic structure problem. And uh, that problem is solving for electronic wave functions with fixed nuclei, essentially Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Now, this electronic structure problem is a part of a larger quantum problem about the molecular wave function. And you can, uh, after solving the electronic structure problem, go and solve for the molecular wave function, obtain its all static and dynamic properties. From a mathematical point of view, electronic structure problem is an eigenvalue problem with the fixed parameters. Uh, at the moment of the solving for the electronic variables, uh, you keep the nuclear configuration fixed, right? And then if you want to obtain the potential energy surfaces, you need to redo the calculation in a different uh, configuration of nuclei, right? And because uh, the problem is still exactly non-solvable, it's like multidimensional uh, differential equation. It's uh, exponentially hard for a classical computer. And uh, that's why it's interesting to apply quantum computers to this problem 
But uh, the nice thing about this electronic structure problem is that uh, after solving it, you can uh, answer some interesting questions uh, for the chemistry, uh, even without going to the full problem. That's why it seems like a, a nice problem to focus efforts of uh, quantum computing. With that, I would like to thank you for attention and uh, leave you with uh, some questions for further discussion. And uh, I'll see you at the next lecture.